everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Jeff Simon. Hi Jeff. Hey buddy. Hi Joanna. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Jeff is a federal forensic investigator and has participated in high profile cases, including 9-11 and the Iraq war, as well as murder cases and other crimes. He's certified in the collection and preservation of evidence, blood spatter analysis, autopsies and laboratory techniques. Jeff is also a certified federal polygraph examiner and highly skilled in the psychophysiological detection of deception, which is well done. Pos it's possible the best bio I've ever read. So Jeff, tell us a bit more about your background and how you got into this work. That is actually a story. I get asked that a lot, but uh, it, it actually fell into my lap. Um, I used to teach forensics uh, at George Washington University. And the number one question I would always get from my students is how, how do I get into this? How do I get to do what I, what you do? And hardest question for me to answer, because literally I was in Korea how many stories start that way? I was in Korea uh, working for the State Department, um, uh, basically admin, doing filing and, and that sort of thing. And um, there was an, a U.S. Air Force person who died. And when you are somebody who works for the American government and are in that position outside of America, if something happens to you, um, our government says that you will have an autopsy. Next of kin does not have a say in that. And uh, where they do autopsies in the Asian theater for Americans is Okinawa. And so the remains had to be transported from Korea to Okinawa. And I was the newest one in country. And so I got volunteered, yay, uh, to do that. And, uh, and so I had to basically escort these remains and, and be in that autopsy. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a part of it, but I had to. And the pathologist was really, really good with where I was in, with my personality and my hesitation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And he just would give me little tasks throughout the entire autopsy. And as I did little tasks, little tasks, little tasks, before I knew it, the autopsy was done. I went back to Korea, had my little life. It was fine. And about six months later, I got a, a call from this pathologist. And he said, listen, the government is putting together a specialized forensics program. We're looking for volunteers. Um, you know, we'll send you to school, but then you'll the, your payback will be time served with the government. Would you be interested if you put a package together? I'll back it. And I said, sure. And that is my origin story. And when so someone asked, well, how can I do what you do? I was like, well, you know, go to Korea. I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> well, but surely it comes from presumably this guy noticed that you weren't freaking out. I mean, you weren't like throwing up in a corner or something. So there must have been something about your character that worked in that situation. I guess so. I guess um, uh, because he set it up for me where I was very task oriented during that time, um, that fit well with what I could handle during that during that procedure. And, you know, once once I actually got into forensics and 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 learned the science and reason beside be, behind things, it, it became much less gory for me. It became much more academic and a job that needed to be done. So mm. is that if that makes sense? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I mean, I think. I think that kind of leads me into my, my next question, which is, you know, we mentioned there in your bio, you were in the 9-11. I mean, that, that job yep. there was accompanying human remains. I mean, th there are, there's an emotional side. I mean, obviously, there's, you're, you're doing a job, as you say, but there's an emotional side of working with death, especially in these mass death situations. So how, how do you practically do your job while still respecting uh, the, the dead? So that's another a popular question I get. And I, the, uh, how it's mostly phrased to me is, do you have a switch? Do you turn it on and off? Um, how do you deal with the emotions of it? And I, um, I was kind of thrown into the deep end of the pool when I started my forensics career in that my first specialty, uh, my first focus in forensics when I actually started doing investigations uh, was in the realm of crimes against children. And so it was through there, through through those types of cases that I uh, developed the way I approach this very quickly. And that is you have to look at what you're doing. And I, I don't want to say that it's a switch that I mean, can turn off my emotions so much because the emotions are still there and the emotions are valid. And actually, the, I believe the emotions are needed. But it's a way of looking at the task at hand. So like when I was working with children, 
the task at hand is these people, these little, you know, young people are a victim here and I'm the one tasked to help them. And if I'm an emotional mess crying in the corner, I'm not helping them. And so I've got to, I've got to take my emotions and channel them in a way that I can do my job for them. And then when I started autopsies, it was basically the same thing. I am the last person involved with, with this person here, with this deceased person. And this is, this is this deceased person's last medical exam. This is this deceased person chance to, to get any sort of justice. And if I become emotional about it, I'm not fulfilling that task. And in a way of honoring them, it's channeling those emotions so that you can do your job. Mm. No, that's a great way of putting it. Um, and of course, a lot of people write books in order to kind of deal with a lot of this stuff and um, it brings up emotions. But I, I wondered about the stereotypes of people who work with death. Now, um, it's so funny because, you know, you, you get the kind of creepy bug guy or the goth woman in the corner with the black makeup. And so listen, let's just... you say creepy and goth. <laughs> I say attractive, you know. <laughs> No, I, I'm with you, and I, I call myself a vanilla goth, actually, because I'm goth on the inside. Um, but um, what what types of people work in the kind of the death arena as such, so we can write more authentic characters? Because I feel like as writers, we do often write these stereotypical people dealing with death. Yeah, and I, I think I'm going to answer that two ways, if you don't mind. And the first way is, write them as normal people, because... The, uh, the coroner doing the autopsy is still a mom who has to get to soccer practice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the the medical examiner who's who's trying to deal with the latest mass shooting is also, you know, somebody who is hoping that he gets the date he wants or whatever. So they, they are legitimately we are normal people, but also we are people who are able to remain calm in in an emergency and are able to do, I guess, what I was talking about before and sort of use our emotions instead of being controlled by our emotions. That's I, th I think that's how I would answer that. Mm. So you're basically saying just write normal people. Like, yeah. is, do you think there's anything special? Because I think there's something special. Oh, I think I'm darn special. No, uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> We're also very funny, if you haven't noticed. Um, is there anything special? Well, you know, talking about funny, I, we tend to have a specific sense of humor. Uh, uh, it's, I, I believe if you boil it down, it is sort of a defense mechanism, but we are able to find the humor and the joke in, in most situations and probably the more emotional, the more humor is used. And so it may be, we may be a little bit more on the morbid side, but we're also not, you know, we don't sleep in the basement. You know? <laughs> in the coffin. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so that's one issue with stereotypes. The other thing, and when I was reading um, one of your many books um, about forensics, uh, talking about stereotypes of identifying the body. Now, I thought, because of TV, obviously, that tattoos could be used to identify a body. So um, what are the real methods of positive identification? So there are, there are three scientific methods of of identifying a body and when i say scientific uh, that's what we call having a positive id it is scientifically backed and we can say therefore this is this person and those three methods are dna uh odontology which are teeth uh so you can identify someone through if you have previous dental records you can identify them through their teeth or fingerprints and those are the only three positive identification methods. Now, can you identify people with, by other means? You can, but we don't say it as, um, as positive. So you can use tattoos, but the problem is a completely different person can go to the same tattoo artist and happen to get the same tattoo in the same area of their body. So how can you say that this is in fact that person? And because of decomposition, um, affects and um, and just different types of uh, states that the bodies can be found in, we no longer rely on um, visual ID. We no longer re rely on like family members coming in to identify the body. Either the body can look different uh, because of decomposition or the family member can be in an emotional state where they, 
you know, they, they're not seeing what they think they're seeing. And so uh, it's just not reliable. And there are too many misidentifications by using those methods. You can use those methods to help in your identification, but there are only three positive IDs. So well, I'm really surprised now because you said you don't have the family member come in and ID the body, which has to be one of the most regular scenes in films and books. Well, it's dramatic, right? Totally dramatic. It's yeah. far more dramatic than you entering some little cell into a, a computer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are the other things that are completely wrong or that you see and go, oh, that again, in a book or, or a movie or a film? Well, you know, it's mostly... Um, if anyone is is writing a scene in the morgue, what typically I find the scene is, is the law enforcement person going to the pathologist to get the update or to talk. And when you go to the morgue, the pathologist is always in the morgue and there are always bodies about. And that's that's not how it happens. Um, every every doctor that works in the morgue um, has his or her own office, and that's where they do their meetings. And when they go to the actual morgue part of it, they're there to do the autopsy. And the bodies don't just lie out. The bodies are stored in a refrigerated room that are that is put away until that that those remains are needed. And so um, you never have a consultation with a law enforcement person over the body. Um, it just... Everyone's just going, oh my goodness. <laughs> How can how can it possibly be dramatic then if there's nobody? <laughs> Wait, there's there's no drama in sitting across a desk from someone. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, I mean, so so in Bones, I mean Bones, the TV show, they sometimes have the body in the middle of what looks like the Smithsonian, right? It's in the middle of the whole museum. <laughs> well, let's also remember in Bones, isn't that the show that they have that wonderful holograph image maker thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't quite gotten to that state yet. <laughs> oh, no. So and anything else that people regularly get wrong? Um, yes, but in, in most of these situations I bring up, I understand why fiction, you can fudge it a little. And, and that I'm a firm believer in. Your story is what's important. That's what your readers are buying your books for. And if you need to fudge a little bit, it's totally OK. You don't have to be a thousand percent realistic. I mm -hmm. say what's more important than realism is consistency. And so if you're going to write it, if, if this is your world and in your world building, it's not exactly as it is in the real life, that's fine. Just be consistent with it and have it be that way in your world. But then don't claim that you're completely realistic. Mm -hmm. But uh, my example with that is, is, you know, you never uh, let me let me rephrase that during an autopsy. We take what we call personal protective equipment very seriously. Mm -hmm. We cannot chance adding our our hairs or whatever as evidence onto the body. But also we need to protect ourselves uh, health wise and, and whatnot, because you're dealing with uh, uh, blood and body fluids and whatnot. But on screen, it's very difficult to have your actors with masks on all the time. And so um, what we typically have on TV shows and, and movies is, you know, these beautiful actors standing over the body, fixing their hair, doing whatever. And we you don't really see that. But I also understand why it is that way, because you need the in very short amount of time, each person, the, the audience to be able to identify what person is doing what. Mm. And so, you know, you can fudge it a little bit, but that's not realistic. Mm. <laughs> no, that that makes sense. Um, but if you're writing a novel as opposed to a TV show, you can definitely sure. put, put on some protective equipment. And in fact, a little off topic, but I've just read The Hot Zone by Richard Preston about Ebola and a whole load of people doing autopsies on monkeys and stuff. And it was just, it was so scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> so, so you, you take that protection very seriously. Yeah, uh, I imagine. In, in the real world. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you do you I mean, you know, a lot of writers, you speak a lot of writers things and you have some great examples of decomposition, the difference between a zombie and a mummy. And a lot of people now will have zombies and mummies in their heads. So using those examples, can you talk a bit about decomposition? I, I can. Um, uh, the the three uh, main characters you see in fiction that do, that relate directly back to decomposition are you said two of them zombies and mummies and vampires and how we view each of those 
different creatures literally has a, 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 a direct path back to actual decomposition. Vampires, for example, we often uh, visualize as very white faced and sometimes with black veins. And that is an, an early that comes from an early stage of decomposition when the blood seeps out of your arteries and veins you become quite pale and that's typically de depicted with having a white face and as the decomposition starts the one major factor of decomposition is the bacteria in your body as the bacteria as the blood leaves the um, veins and arteries those become passageways for the for the bacteria and as they are um, leaving their waste behind it darkens the veins and that's where you get those black veins in mm. for vampires Zombies and, and mummies tend to be on opposite end of the spectrums for different types of decomposition. Decomposition really is environmentally uh, based, um, whether it's a wet environment or a dry environment, a cold environment or a hot environment, um, whether it changes environments because somebody moves the body. All of those have a great effect on the rate and type of, of decomposition. So when you're thinking about a zombie, how they're typically um, depicted are green and squishy and, and whatnot. And that's, that is a, a um, pretty valid depiction of a later stage normal decomposition. Um, the, the body changes color, typically greenish color, until it ultimately turns more like a blackish color. Um, and it's, it's very wet but in mummification and when i say mummification i don't mean the egyptian procedure of taking out the organs and whatnot I, it's literally called mummification as a stage in decomposition it's a very arid a very dry environment in which the the moisture is out of the air and because the moisture is out of the air the bacteria can't um go uh you can't function or live as well as in a normal i say normal environment but as in a, a environment we're used to and so mummies tend to be more brown and brittle instead of squishy if you will and um we see that when you when you depict them in fiction and uh and so i i i love that they each of these have sort of their base in an actual decomposition uh, mm. method, which, yeah. which is pretty it's pretty cool like is, are there any other creatures made up of the stages of decomposition <laughs> I oh, gosh, i'd have to think about that for a minute i'm not sure i'll well, get back to that one <laughs> well i guess that well one could ask the um a, a more supernatural question i mean you know in terms of ghosts and um uh have you know do you feel like the dead body is a dead body and there's it's just it's gone there is no person left um do you feel like there or have you experienced any kind of supernatural or ghost-like encounters i haven't had any personal um uh, extra experiences like that but i feel like um uh i don't how do i answer that i feel like you do i do um treat each all remains as with respect. I guess that's how I want to say that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are various beliefs throughout the world on what happens to a person after death. And um, some beliefs are the, the eternal soul is linked to the condition of the body. Some, some beliefs are once the person's dead that their essence is elsewhere and, and the vessel no longer is that person. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of everything in between. And I think... I think that remains need to be treated with respect, um, j just so that everybody is honored, if you will, and all beliefs are honored. Um, and I think we find that um, even, uh, at least in the, in the United States, like my my all all of my experience forensically is United States, just to, mm. to make that clear. But um, you know, if we have a body that is unidentified, or better yet, unclaimed. Um, so you can't find next of kin or the next of kin just outright refuses to take um, take responsibility for the body. You know, what do we do with those bodies? And, you know, a body is released to a mortuary and they normally release it to a funeral home. But what if you don't have that permission or even know what the family would wish for that body? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the counties or states all have laws in that any unclaimed remains will either be buried or cremated and buried by that county or state. So they, 
they they still respect the remains. And I, I have the sort of the same outlook on that, that, yeah, there is a respect involved. Mm. Well, in, I, I think the other thing I was thinking of then is in America, from what I've read, um, embalming is very common, whereas in, in the UK, certainly, um, it's not very common at all it's it's just not something people do so you know when we're thinking about and you know many of the listeners are crime writers or um so if if someone you know and there's often the scene of digging up the remains to do some test and you know in britain that will be a decomposed body um whereas in america is it is that is that true about an embalming and does embalming for example get rid of evidence or keep evidence or what what would be that difference so um, if you were, well, there, there are exhumations in the United States, but what I was going to say is one, one of the steps in an autopsy is, is to take samples of every tissue and organ, uh, for storage. And that is, and that is strictly the, the entire purpose is if you need to do tests later on, you would have the actual tissue preserved and, and, and whatnot for that purpose. Um, Embalming slows down decomposition greatly, but it doesn't stop it. And so when um, if we were to do an exhumation even here in the United States in, a, in on remains that have been embalmed, um, they are not in pristine condition from that point on. It just is it's just greatly slowed. Mm. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's so interesting. And I mean, again, coming back to the mummies, um, if you've traveled in Europe, right? To the, yes. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of sites in Europe, you know, Italy particularly, um, of, of skeletons and mum, mummied um, monks and things in yep. catacombs and, and crypts and things. So is that, I mean, the mummification, te- not technique, um, but that can happen in a natural environment as well, right? Absolutely. The whole deal with mummification is... Uh, the arid conditions of when the body is going through its decomposition. And decomposition is typically furthered by that bacteria that's inside of us. And in a very, very dry, um, moisture-less uh, environment, that bacteria dies out and is unable to go through that decomposition process. And so what you have is a very brittle result but even though the body, the skin, and the organs and the bones and whatnot are very brittle, um, they're they're really well preserved because they're not being eaten away, as we would think in in normal conditions. And so that is why you can see these mummies throughout the world on 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 exhibit because the the drying out process has actually preserved that body. Yeah, um, but but they all look withered because there's no moisture. It, they, they literally are withered. Mm. Yeah, very cool. Um, okay, so back on the fictionalized stuff because yes, I yes. loved the examples that you had of the different autopsies by genre. <laughs> so I wondered if you'd give us a couple of examples of those because they are sure. brilliant. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I just, I just, you know, when I when I write my books, my my books are literally a series called forensics for fiction because my my goal is to help out authors and so when i'm writing about a particular topic i want all authors to know that hey this could apply to you as well and so when you think of an autopsy you know a police procedural is is a pretty common genre that you would expect to find those in but autopsies could be in in really any genre um uh, i like to use the example for you know a thriller um, in any sort of contagion type storyline or or even um, um, the like the Da Vinci Code, uh, an autopsy is very important to start that clock, that ball rolling in the thriller. Um, so you can think of that there, but you can use an autopsy in in romance or emotion or a more emotion filled story in the, I mean, uh, death is a very emotional experience. And, you know, depending on how you're writing, I don't know, you could you could have your main character question why she's flirting with the doctor when she should be mourning her husband. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> evil husband, mourning evil husband. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but you can you can have autopsies in paranormal. Um, how how does your paranormal character have a uh, different anatomy and how does that affect how does that affect your autopsy? You can have uh, autopsies in science fiction and fantasy for the same reason. Is, is this an alien creature or is technology different? Um, 
and uh, and in historicals, how how was the autopsy done back in that era? And was religion more of a factor back then? Uh, were were the tools limiting back then? So I think I think that you can really apply it in in any genre um, to to work through either uh, furthering the story technically or furthering the story emotionally. Mm. Yeah, it, was, it just reminded me, there's this very creepy thing in Europe um, where they put bells on coffins um, that linked down into the, the grave because, of course, yes. they didn't have the technology. So you, sometimes people were buried alive. And, of course, you don't want to be right. buried alive. <laughs> So the historical stuff is fascinating, but I loved um, uh, I loved the sort of anatomy of a goblin, um, which is brilliant. I've n- I've never read the anatomy of a goblin in an in a I goblin very, autopsy. Very few people have, and so <laughs> plot bunny. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really it's a, it's such a good a good idea. So um, I uh, anyone who's read my fiction will know I'm particularly obsessed with medical specimens and um, human body parts in jars. I I have in a lot of my books and the history. History, talking about history, the medical history is fascinating. I was in Philadelphia, went to the Mutter Museum um, oh. last, yeah, which is fantastic, right? Really fascinating. So obviously you've talked about respect and that's yeah. taken as a given, but what what are your um, what are your thoughts on, on anatomy museums, the physical body being used after death for research? I, uh, you know, I like I said, I think respect is important, but I don't think that um, using a body uh, for scientific or, or just plain uh, basic educational needs is has to necessarily mean that you're not being respectful. I think it's incredibly important for us to continually learn and to understand what happens to our bodies so that we can understand what needs to be done um, to help us while we're still alive, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't have a problem with that. I think, I think we do that when we're alive anyway. Um, if, if somebody develops a new, uh, medication, they go through all these trials and they ask for your consent to go through these trials, understanding that, you know, this may help this, there may be side effects. We don't know yet. This is all for experimentation. And I think it's the same idea with a, with, someone who's passed the only problem is they are no longer present for the consent part but Mm. many many people get around that by um, having the consent be done prior to the person passing and so i feel like if you are doing it in a respectful manner um i i'm for it i i think it's it's beneficial uh, it's interesting if you if you go into the history of autopsies, um, they didn't always follow the respect rule and, and often were referred to as butchers because that's sort of what it was. They uh, the early earlier people studying anatomy uh, did it because they were curious or morbid or whatever. But they I don't think that they were really considering the consent side of things. Um, and, but I don't think it has to be that way. I think it can it can definitely be respectful and still. Um, beneficial scientifically. Mm. Well, I was just thinking that uh, cr- criminals often used um, after hanging here in, here in Britain, the Hunterian Museum is full of <laughs> criminals <laughs> or supposed criminals, who yep. knows? <laughs> but yep. uh, it is it is fascinating. Now, I also wanted, um, I, I, there are so many things I wanted to ask you and you have like, you've got a book on blood spatter as well, which is particularly cool. But I do want to ask you about the polygraph side because that really caught my eye. It seems to me that the polygraph side of your work is completely different to your other stuff, the kind of forensic stuff. So why, why the polygraph side as well? Well, because, uh, my entire career has been in law enforcement and has been sort of on the, uh, scientific side of, of law enforcement. And, um, and that is the next scientific endeavor that I, that I entered. Um, I, I should be clear that I, I don't do all of this at once. Mm. Um, I, <laughs> Cause you can't really do uh, one on a dead. Bus. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I was involved with autopsies when 
I ha when I held a position with the Armed Forces Medical Examiner's Office. And so that's specifically what we did was autopsies. Mm -hmm. I am no longer in that position. And now I do I, I go to crime scenes. I deal with preservation of evidence and I do interviews. And in the interview side of my job is where I was afforded the opportunity to get certified and become a polygrapher. And so I don't want you thinking that, you know, all specialties are at one person does all specialties at all times. It depends on what job you have and, and, and mm -hmm. what, what your focus is. But the, the reason I, I, uh, I looked into polygraph and, and then ended up going to the school and becoming certified is because it's a scientific technique, uh, used in the, um, investigation of criminals. And so, and so that's what I, that's what I did. <laughs> and, and again, I mean, it seems to me another one of those things that there's so many, again, all of us think in our heads, you know, of the person sitting in the room with the thing around their arm and someone pressing buttons or whatever. <laughs> I mean, again, right. are there any, um, any issues with the way that type of thing is portrayed? Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, when most people think of polygraph, they think of uh, you know, daytime TV and who your baby daddy. And um, <laughs> I will just say there are different types of polygraph tests. And um, and it is a, it is a valid science that is over dramatized greatly mm. <laughs> in popular thinking. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, when I when I think I, I just found that that fascinating. I mean, the the is the thread for your your work is it's all solving a, a solving the crime basically. Correct, yes. Yeah, which is fantastic. Right, so tell us um about the other books or all of your books in the forensic series so everyone knows what you have. Okay, great. Thank you. Um yeah, so I started this series called Forensics for Fiction and how that sort of came about was I live with a writer. <laughs> I was constantly being asked, um, well, how would this work? Or, or how long does someone need to be poisoned before? Or if I was going to dispose of the body? Um, and so I got used to answering those questions. And as he would then travel and, and go to his different conferences or talk to other writers, I would get more questions from more writers. And uh, it, it didn't take me a lot of research to discover that there were sort of two ends of the spectrums if a writer wanted to do research. You could either get the really technical, like, school book version of it, which is really hard to read and, and slog through, or you could get a kind of fluff piece that sort of didn't really touch on much of what was realistic or, or how things were done, but basically just sort of barely gr uh, glazed over a lot of it. And I, I found very few books that had that that median of mm -hmm. of it was accessible on one side but but realistic and and technical enough on the other and that's what started the idea of my forensics for fiction series and that's literally what it is i'm trying to take the realism of what i do what my um uh, partners and 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 other agents do in real life and make it accessible for the writer so that they understand what the realism is but better yet, decide what works for their story. Mm -hmm. Because again, I don't believe that all stories have to be a thousand percent realistic. If you're going to be a thousand percent realistic, then you're going to have the cop talking to the pathologist across the desk. And again, I don't know how dramatic that is. <laughs> and so, um, but I want to provide a platter that you as, as authors can pick from for what works for your story and, and give it a base that is absolutely based in realism. So uh, that's how that started. And my first book was Blood Spatter. And uh, from there, I wrote uh, my book on crime scenes. And then I did autopsies. Uh, the next one that will come out will be on arson. And so, ah. yeah. Interesting. And, and will you be doing anything on on um, polygraphy and, and deception? Or is that just going to give people too many tips? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was I was joking with you a little bit about uh, before this interview, and there is there is a line actually there is a line um, of how realistic uh, am I comfortable with you all being, and then at what point does your fiction become a instruction manual for an actual criminal? So I uh, you know I I figure that out for myself, and then and then I'll then I present it to you all, but. Um, if there's a real, uh, if, if there's a genuine interest in any uh, subtopic of forensics or investigation, I'm more than 
open to either talking about it or if mm. there's enough material writing about it sure mm. i think my interest in the in that deception side is because i think that most fiction writers are well we're, we're liars we we <laughs> we li we lie and we make things up for a right. living so i just i kind of i guess i'm just really interested in the psychology of people who make stuff up um i don't know if you have any thoughts on whether like we'd be much better at, at poly polygraph tests than people who aren't so imaginative <laughs> well um uh Yes and no. <laughs> the deal with polygraph is it is is its entire uh, premise, its scientific base is is based on something internally. You guys don't have to remember this, but it, it's called the autonomic nervous system, which is something that we can't control with our brain. It, they are physical responses that occur um, s separate from okay. our cognitive thought mm -hmm. and because they're sort of automatic and we can't control them that is where the polygraph comes in and it's monitoring those reactions within your body so even even well-versed liars you know still can't control the reactions they have with inside their body but to sort of take a, a sharp left turn here real quick i think what i would say for people writing that is the same thing that i say about people um writing crime scenes and that is if you want to write about lying or or solving a crime the best way to do that is to figure out how the how you're going to resolve that issue before you get into writing the issue itself mm -hmm. and when i when i'm talking about crime scenes i say solve your crime before you commit it because what most the the trap that most people most authors fall into is they have an exciting idea about a crime scene. You've never heard about this crime scene before. I've got the best idea ever. And they're writing it and they're writing it and they're writing it and they're writing it. And they make the evidence very vague because they don't want it solved in chapter two. They need a whole book worth of investigations and they're great, they're great, they're great. And they get to the second to last chapter and they're like, now I've got to solve it. How do I solve it? And so they open themselves up to, a, to logic leaps because they haven't peppered their story with the evidence that's actually there so that the reader can look back and say, oh, and so if you solve it first, if you know what your smoking gun is before you do the actual crime, then you can write your story in the direction of that smoking gun. And same thing with deception. If you know how they're going to get caught in their lie, then you can work that lie in so that you can craft it so that it's a, it's a humdinger of a lie, but it's not a logic leap for them to get caught later on does, uh, does that make sense yeah no that's great yeah. and i must say i mean i i i this interview was mainly about the autopsy one um but your it, your books are like you say detailed technically but not so detailed that they're not really readable like i really oh, enjoyed thank you. yeah i really enjoyed um zoom it zoomed through the autopsy book i was mm. just like oh this is so cool and there's a lot of ideas so um i'd love people to check that out also you um you speak around the world uh, at many writers conferences so so um, we met at Nink, which was really cool. So uh, if anyone listening sees uh, your name, then they should definitely go. But where can people find you and your books online? Oh, thank you so much for that. For that. Um, uh, I am everywhere online and luckily nobody has my name yet. So <laughs> if you look up Jeff Simon, Jeff with a G, Simon with a Y, you should be able to find me. But my website is jeffsimon.com and my book, the website that goes to my books, um, which is part of my main website, is uh, forensicsforfiction.com. Mm -hmm. um, all of my books are sold on all the major areas. If you want to go Amazon, iTunes, Barnes & Noble, wherever, um, you should be able to find them there as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Jeff. That was great. Well, thank you for having me. This was great. It really was fun.